All right. Um, so let's uh, let's kind of get started here. So this uh, presentation, we want to talk about the past, present, and future of Fiber Channel. Uh, past summits, we've had a lot of discussions and, and questions come up about Fiber Channel in OpenStack, and in particular, Fiber Channel in the Cinder project. So uh, we've got a number of people here today, and we're going to do things a little bit different uh, than a lot of presentations. What we're going to do is the four of us here on stage are going to kind of go through a few slides and talk about a few things and some of the efforts and what's going on and share some thoughts. And then we have a whole panel of Cinder developers sitting out front, uh, most of which have Fiber Channel or are working on Fiber Channel. And we want to open it up to a Q&A for, for folks in the audience, um, and we'll all be available to answer questions. And if you look here, we've got a pretty good list of folks. Um, myself, John Griffith, I work from SolidFire, based out of Boulder, Colorado. I've been working on the Cinder project for almost four years now, uh, before it was Cinder, back when it was Nova Volume. We've got Walt Boring from HP. Got Ken Martin from HP or Kurt Martin from HP, <laughs> and we've got Shin from uh, EMC, and then the other folks here are out front and they'll be ready to go. So, on that note, uh, for those of you, just a quick overview: uh, OpenStack. There's the little diagram that everybody loves to show, tell you what it is. Hopefully, you already know that. A little bit about Cinder. Uh, Cinder is an OpenStack block storage service. Uh, provides persistent block storage for instances to be used in an OpenStack cloud. It has a plug-in architecture, which is probably the most important point about Cinder and the most important thing to keep in mind. There are close to 40 available backend drivers that you can use in Cinder as of the Kilo release, which is a lot. It's a lot to choose from. The initial focus of volumes and block storage in OpenStack uh, in, historically was always iSCSI and RBD. Uh, so up until a couple of releases ago, that was your only option and that's pretty much all there was. This is not a talk about Cinder itself though. This is a talk about Fiber Channel and Cinder. So let's talk about Fiber Channel. Uh, Fiber Channel has been around for a long time. Most of you probably already know this. For a while, it was the de facto solution in IT data centers uh, for a number of reasons. Lots of vendors have a lot of great fiber channel devices. Uh, customers, there's a lot of people that have invested and spent a lot of money to have a fiber channel infrastructure, and they already have that set up. And uh, that's a really significant investment. Um, so then you look at something like OpenStack that is predominantly iSCSI, uh, then makes some really hard decisions. So in terms of iSCSI, um, there's a number of people who will tell you that there's things wrong with iSCSI and people will tell you there's things wrong with Fiber Channel. Uh, for the most part, iSCSI, the only thing that's wrong with it is uh, a bad history. So when iSCSI first came out, a lot of people were trying to do things like use one gig networks for iSCSI and share their internet traffic, all their regular networking traffic and everything over iSCSI. That didn't end well. These days, with 10 gig and dedicated networks, iSCSI is a really different story. Uh, it's extremely flexible, it's performant, it's very reliable, uh, it gives you a lot of choices and it makes things really easy. The reason why it was the default in OpenStack in particular is the fact that it's easy to plug in and plug out. Right? So the whole idea is all you need is a network, everybody has a network, so you can test anything and run anything. Fiber channel, that's a little harder to do. But the whole point of OpenStack is to give you options and to give you choices. So over the years, we've been doing a lot of work on Fiber Channel and adding Fiber Channel capabilities. The predominant reason for that is people that have legacy infrastructures and legacy equipment that is Fiber Channel have already made that investment. They still want to adopt OpenStack and run private clouds. So they need to have the ability to do that. And that's how Fiber Channel started. On that note. All right, thanks, John. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the past of the uh, fiber channel implementation within OpenStack, where it's come from, and then I'll hand it off to Kurt. So, okay. So back in the San Diego conference, um, we, it was our first uh, time going to uh, working on OpenStack. And uh, Kurt went to the conference and basically announced that we wanted to uh, uh, implement fiber channel within OpenStack. And we had a bunch of people come up to us from different companies and said, hey, we're really interested in this as well. And so that 
created a working group that we have been meeting about once a month ever since then to work on Fiber Channel, solve some of the problems, and, and discuss where we wanted to go in the future within OpenStack. Um, and so we came back from that conference and said, okay, how are we gonna do this? What we needed to do for our company was to create a volume driver within Cinder that actually supported Fiber Channel, but we didn't have sub Fiber Channel support within Nova at all. Um, so we, we sat down and worked on it. Within a couple hours, we had our first um, attachment working, but we couldn't detach volumes yet. Kind of need to do that. Um, so over the course of the, of the Grizzly release, um, we were able to get the, uh, the Nova patch to land at the very last day as I was in Disneyland with my kids. Kurt was babysitting the patch and helpful <laughs> was helping to get it to land. Um, so what did we end up at the end of the Grizzly release? We're, we're able to attach volumes and detach them, but you had to have your, your fabric pre-zoned. And that's not optimal, right? Um, it's completely impractical and not very cloudy to do that. So what we had to do was we went back to this working group that we're meeting once a month, a, a lot of companies, and we, and we co-designed what we call now the Fiber Channel Zone Manager. And the zone manager's job is to do the automated zoning for us. So that way, when you do an attachment of a volume, it automatically creates the zone in the fiber channel switches to create the fabric for you so that way the two endpoints can see each other. All right. So this was added in the Ice House release cycle. A lot of companies were involved with it. Um, Brocade, HP, EMC, IBM. Um, and it, it's, it's a really good example of why I personally love working on this project because we have a lot of different companies working together as a community to make this stuff work and it benefits everyone. Um, so I'm really proud of that. Okay, so what are the pieces of the zone manager? There's three main components. Um, the zoning, which is adding and removing of, uh, of the zone, and then the lookup service. And we have a pluggable architecture in the zone manager itself that allows us to have vendor-specific drivers that knows how to talk to the vendor uh, switches themselves. So the lookup service, its purpose is to help um, the volume drivers create a, an initiator target map that knows which two endpoints can actually talk to each other, basically the worldwide names of either side. So that way when you do an attachment or the export on the target side, you know which ports to export your volume to. And then the host on the initiator side will see them. So the zoning is basically simple, add a zone, remove a zone. Um, one of the pitfalls that uh, some of the volume drivers fall under when we're doing reviews is they, they pass in the, um, the initiator target map every time you do a removal of a volume. Well, you don't want to remove that zone if you still have volumes attached, right? So um, that's one of the things that we look for and, and Kurt will talk about. Um, so the, the two vendors that we have support in the zone manager today, as listed on the slide here, is Brocade and Cisco. And we're actively developing on the zone manager and adding new features. Um, and this is a little bit of an overview of what the architecture looks like. It's very simple. Um, we have the lookup service and the zone add removal API. And then the layer underneath that is where all the vendors plug into that architecture. So we have um, a lot of classes that uh, for each of the, the vendors, Brocade and Cisco knows how to do a lookup service that conform to the APIs, just like we do for volume drivers, right? There's a, a given API that the volume manager talks to the volume drivers. Well, it's the same thing with the zone manager. You have to support the lookup service. You have to support add and removal of zones. And then it's their job to talk to the, uh, to the actual switch. So from there, we'll talk a little bit about um, the uh, volume drivers and the support that all the vendors have within Cinder. Kurt? Thanks, Walt. Uh, yeah, as Walt mentioned, when we first started this, we had to you know, basically pre-create your zones, which wasn't very usable um, in the real world in the cloud. So in the early time frame, uh, Grizzly, Havana, Icehouse, we had HP, IBM, EMC, submit drivers but once the as you can see by the number of vendors uh, once we hit um, Juno and had that zone manager ironed out there was more drivers and we really hit a lot of new drivers and new vendors in the kilo and uh, time frame um, 
the Liberty, uh, as we see it, I mean, it's just getting going. I mean, there's already, you know, four, three new vendors, uh, and HP's putting another one up. More vendors, uh, it's, it's really starting to take off. And as you can see by the logos, there is a number of um, options out there for the, for the end users, for the fiber channel drivers. What are the, the requirements uh, in, that are required? Of course, it's got to meet the minimum requirements for any volume driver. But there's a few special things for fiber channel drivers. And, and one of those is you have to extend from the, from the fiber channel base class. <coughs> and as Walt mentioned, there, the fiber channel zone manager, we have decorators that you have to decorate the initialized connection with to take advantage of the zone manager. Um, so there's a decorator for, uh, you know, add fiber channel zone. So that will call in if the, if the zone manager drivers are configured in sender comp, it will actually go and auto create the zones for you when you do an attach. Likewise on uh, zone removal, so on terminate connection in the drivers, you have a remove fiber channel zone. And as Walt had mentioned, you, be caref you have to be careful because uh, it's the driver's responsibility to figure out if the last volume is connected to that host before it actually removes the zone. You don't want to wipe out the other ones. And also, at starting in the Kilo release, all sender drivers require, are required to have uh, continuous integration, third-party CI. Every patch set that's put up in the sender comes back and runs uh, a slew of tests on real hardware back in all the vendor sites. The results get posted up. So uh, in iSCSI, it, you, you have your network and, and it's just over Ethernet, but there's a little few gotchas for fiber channel. When you're running your CI environment within a VM on open, in OpenStack, you need to get the HBA information passed through to the VM. Um, there's a couple different solutions for CI that people have, but PCI pass-through will solve that, that requirement and get the HBA information, PCR. PCI for infor information passed up to the VMs. Um, we have a, a, a number of people in the community that will that will help with CI. I put uh, Rami Oslin. Uh, his his IRC name is Os Oslin. He's always in the Cinder channel. He's available. He he has a, uh, the the CI solution for the infra channel. Trying to get that all. So it's more of a push button solution. And also Duncan Thomas. So if if there's questions on getting CI running for fiber channel please visit the uh, OpenStack sender channel and uh, ping one of these two guys. Uh, I'd like to pass it over to Jing now that we'll talk about some of the futures uh, that we're looking for for fiber channel. So right now there are uh, two Cinder specs being reviewed. Um, one is the friendly zone names. Currently, the zone names contains uh, the WWPMs of the host and the target, so it's not friendly. The proposal is to uh, add the host name and also storage system names into the zone names to make it more readable. And the second one is the virtual fabric support in the Brocade zone manager. Um, Cisco already has that support for the vSAN. That's the equivalent to this. So those are right now being reviewed. Um, and the QA support per zone, that's another thing that uh, could be added in the future um, so that every zone has a different uh, QoS level um, that specifies what's the priority of the traffic flow between the uh, host and the target. Um, and another thing is the MPIV support in Libert. So right now, um, you, if you partition the uh, HBA into multiple virtual, vir, um, virtual HBAs, you can't do a pass-through and uh, present that into a guest. So you, you, the only way you get it worked is to pass through the entire, H, uh, entire HBA. So it's just not efficient. Um, and then the, and another thing that I want to mention here is um, we're talking about that uh, we want to move the zone manager into a sub-project um, into under sender so that it can be um, released as a like a standalone library just like the OS brick so that it can be leveraged by other projects in the future. So those are the future work, future efforts. Those are just uh, some uh, useful links. Those are 
um, like blueprints, actually old blueprints that give you some background of the FC support and the zone manager. That's uh, all we have, so you guys have come up so we can take some questions. <laughs> so r real quick, um, show of hands, how many, how many people are OpenStack developers in the room or vendors that are providing product? Okay. How many people are actually using OpenStack, deploying OpenStack, and considering deploying it with Fiber Channel? Okay, so a few. Um, so a lot of this talk is it's kind of a mixed talk, right? There's, there was a lot of technical information and stuff like that. Um, when we talk about the NPIV pass-through and stuff like that, um, that's really only applicable to people that are developing a driver and need to run CI, or people that are running triple O models, where OpenStack on OpenStack. Otherwise, it's, it's important to note that the whole point you know, in Cinder is we want to keep that connection and usage model exactly the same, whether it's iSCSI or Fiber Channel. So you as a user or a consumer of OpenStack don't actually need to know anything about NPIV or zone managers or anything like that. That's all supposed to be abstracted and handled for you. It's all automated. Um, so I, I just wanted to point that out because I think it's important. Yeah. Um, if you're not familiar with it, you might be a little confused after seeing some of that. So, um, but on that note, if, if there are any questions. Um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out, John. So basically, the, the only thing as a deployer you really need to know or understand about Fiber Channel is um, uh, you have to know where your switches are, right? There's some cinder.conf entries that you have to put in um, to configure the different fabrics that you want to support. Um, which basically is a URI to the switch and then uh, the authentication for it. And then after that, Cinder basically takes care of everything for you. So when you do a volume attach, it automatically creates the zone for you and removes it for you appropriately. Um, so that way the attaches just work. Um, and were there any questions out there? Yeah. Go ahead. I have two questions. Um, First is, what is the integration with the BNA on the brocade side instead of direct to a switch, as you mentioned? So we have a rather large fabric, um, multiple. So at the time uh, when we implemented, the solution is directly uh, to the switch. But Angela, that stood up in the very back, she's with brocade. She will tell you some more of the future plans that they're working on for, for exactly that. The question was integration with BNA? So OpenStack integration? Can you use the mic? Please? I was just Thank you. clarifying the question. That yeah, so there's no future plans. Sorry. There's no uh, plans right now to integrate OpenStack with BNA or point OpenStack at BNA. We contact the switch directly via SSH or future plan is for HTTPS. So <coughs> clear. My understanding is BNA has the REST APIs that can expose all the fabrics that are managed by that. Right. Um, is so, it? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so you're interested in fabric management through OpenStack? OpenStack managing those fabrics through okay. our central management tool. Okay. So that is a, a topic that we are discussing okay. about future um, OpenStack um, a fiber, fiber channel network okay. management. The second one would be um, zoning and the serialization for uh, zone set changes. Um, does the FCZM manage um, concurrency uh, for humans interacting with the fabric as well as automation interacting with the fabric? So currently the zone manager doesn't, doesn't know anything about humans talking to the switch. So if a human goes in and removes the zone, the zone manager doesn't know that that's actually happened. Um, and, and in terms of uh, the parallelism, I, I suppose, from the sender's perspective, there is a, a local file lock on the zone manager right now for when uh, zones are added and created. So there, there is a critical section there uh, to prevent multiple people trying to remove the same zone. Um, but it's something that we should probably look at in the future to, to ensure that, hey, when you go to remove a zone, it's actually there. And there's some fault tolerance within the drivers themselves that have to manage that to a certain extent, right, um, to, to handle those error conditions. So to kind of add to that, too, one thing to keep in mind that I try and tell a lot of people is um, 
you know, with, with newer things like Fiber Channel and stuff, and, you know, as you point out, there's definitely things that you're going to do differently and that you're going to need that aren't available from the orchestration layer. But kind of the rule of thumb, typically, and, and good advice for most people is either have OpenStack manage things or don't. Um, when you start mixing those two things together, uh, you run into a lot of problems and get a lot of inconsistencies. Um, Unfortunately, there are cases where until things are ready in OpenStack for what you're trying to do, you might have to come up with a way to do that. Uh, but just something to keep in mind going forward. Yeah, th uh, that's correct, John. I mean, that's pretty much the case with our volume drivers with the arrays. I mean, if you create a volume in Cinder and then go delete it on the actual array itself without going through Cinder, there's obviously going to be problems there, right? And, and Cinder itself can't know that someone else is has done that outside of it. And, and so as soon as you, the way we look at it is as, as soon as you plug in that infrastructure component and have Cinder manage it, then it's really Cinder's purview to, to own it at that, at that point. Okay, any other uh, questions? Yeah, go ahead. If you can use the mic, that would be great, please. Or speak really loud, I can repeat yeah. the question. <laughs> I'll be the mic. Do you have, <clears throat> Do you have a feeling for how prevalent the use of fiber channel with OpenStack currently is? And do you think it's going to expand or, or become less and less as time goes on? Considering there's a lot of work involved in trying to get all the zoning working with Cinder and so on. So that's really the question. Have you got a feeling for how prevalent it is? And, yeah. so, so I think I'm, I'm going to give my opinion, um, and then I'll let some other folks give their opinions as well. Um, so you've probably noticed that the, the bulk of the discussion uh, that's been here and, and things that we've been talking about is vendors, um, not users, uh, not community. Personally, from, from my viewpoint, what I have seen in the user community is a lot of people given the choice between the two in a greenfield are definitely going the iSCSI route. Um, iSCSI has come a long way. Uh, it's pretty good technology. It's pretty solid. That being said, traditional legacy shops that already have fiber channel that want to use that same gear that they already have or reuse that infrastructure, that's where the, the demand in the community for fiber channel, that's where I'm seeing that demand right now. Does that make sense? So. Yeah, that, that's pretty much the way we view it as well. I mean, we. we a lot of our customers for our array, they're primarily fiber channel based. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we enabled OpenStack for them for that particular reason. Now, in terms of the global community and, and what percentage of that is, we, we really don't know. But um, in terms of iSCSI versus fiber channel, that discussion is no different outside of OpenStack than it is inside of OpenStack right now. So what we're trying to do is ensure that you know, uh, OpenStack is, uh, is, provides as much support as we possibly can to the existing fabrics that are out there, right? So um, we, we don't want to exclude any, anyone at this point. So I just want to add that, uh, yeah, so similar to what you guys are saying, that we are also having customers who, who have this demand. I mean, we have both, right? There are customers who want ice cousin, there are customers who want FC. I don't think it's going away because they have already made a lot of investment in FC. So they definitely want to move that into OpenStack. I, I was going to support that. I've actually suddenly seen a real growth in request for it as we have more of our existing users moving to, you know, trying OpenStack. And it's like, well, we want to use our existing fiber channel infrastructure. So, you know, I think I, through sessions like this and some of the work we're doing, there's a, we're going to continue to focus on improving it as we can. You have to remember the difference between public, you know, obviously cost reasons, it wouldn't make sense to do this in a, in a huge public cloud, but in a private cloud, as everybody kind of alluded to, you have, you have your infrastructure there already, and it's, chances are it's being way under, underutilized now, uh, so they're trying out OpenStack, and yeah, we're getting a demand definitely for it. Anybody else want the mic? You don't have to run the mic around. Right. Yeah, we've got plenty of time. Thanks. Uh, hello. 
Um, just thinking on how about um, having both technologies together. I don't know, maybe having in the, in the center uh, several um, backends, like IceCASI, RDB, and Fiber Channel together. Yeah. We, we absolutely do support that today, and, and uh, we do it in-house in, in our testing and development on, on our same blades or servers, if you will. We actually have iSCSI and Fiber Channel volume drivers instantiated and are testing those both in real time, just using different volume types or whatnot to test them both out this, at the same time. So, so, so Cinder offers a, a multi-backend. Actually, it offers two options for multi-backend. Um, you can either deploy them on the same Cinder volume node in one volume service, or you can horizontally scale out like everything else in OpenStack and add more volume nodes that oh, attach to different devices. Absolutely. Yep. If yes, absolutely. Wanna, if you want to incur that pain, you are welcome to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just want to point out, too, we have we support both, and uh, it, it is two separate drivers, so it's it's not like you can uh, have some kind of multipathing between the two, but you can definitely run them both concurrently, and, and that is supported. Yeah, so if you have an existing FC deployment and you're thinking about switching to iSCSI, you know, you can actually deploy it that way and have both at the same time as you're transitioning, even talking to the same array. Uh, so a lot of the arrays support both at the same time. Um, so, for, so it would work in that, in that, in that regard. One point of clarification, though, to be, be careful about is um, there's the assumption that you have a, symbol, a single fabric behind it, that you're not mixing vendors, because that... That does not work, correct? If you have some brocade, some Cisco hardware, you need to have a single fabric environment. Yeah, brocade and Cisco don't play well together. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. But, but I have had people asking about that, though, so I thought this was a good opportunity to bring that up. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, I just got some question about um, when you test the driver uh, for the five, I know. Uh, what's the backend array you are testing, like uh, Hitachi or? It's whoever that vendor is that's yeah. running that test. Um, so, so this is definitely a vendor-driven effort. Um, so HP, for example, has the three-par array that has fiber channel. IBM has store with, with fiber channel. EMC has some fiber channel. Those folks are actually testing their backend devices on fiber channel. Um, going forward, what I would like to see is there is the ability now to do um, use things like LIO mm -hmm. to do fiber channel targets for generic LVM devices and disk back devices, so that we could have something that was a more general, you know, test environment and vendor neutral. I'd like to see something like that take off. Um, whether we will or not, I don't know. I don't know how valuable it is. To be okay. um, currently, yes. Any demo or any use case for like for our environment? Actually, we are using Hitachi, so I can see they have driver for USB, VSP stuff. Right. So. Um, so it's up to it's it's it, it's up to the vendor. It's up to yeah. Hitachi, for example, to provide a fiber channel backend driver for their device inside of Cinder, right? Okay. And then, and, and that's that's your use case. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. Thanks. You can actually go see the CI results. If you, you know, every vendor who has a CI driver now actually we publish results. Yeah, every patch that uh, gets submitted into Cinder is actually now tested against uh, uh, all of the arrays that are supported within Cinder. Um, and that includes all of the fiber channel drivers as well. We have another question in the back. Go ahead. Sure. Um, so as somebody with a large investment in fiber channel currently, I'm interested in this panel's perspective um, as far as, I guess, the prevalence of fibre channel in the market goes. Uh, we see a lot of good still in fibre channel. Um, I know there's brocade people in the room too um, who might want to comment, but I just wonder what your feeling is for the future of the technology. Um, you know, what with direct connected SaaS and, you know, everything iSCSI kicking around the corner on 40 gig and whatnot. Uh, I just I just want to feel from the room to see what they actually believe or perceive. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Uh, I think there's a lot of value. Uh, our customers are primarily fiber channel based because of the of the performance of it. Um, they're willing to invest 
that uh, that high cost to create the fabrics and and do that separate kind of technology um, and and use fiber channel. Um, I can't speak for everyone, but I, I think it's I think it's going to stick around, and we're continuing to develop on it and add more features to it as as Jing talked about in Cinder. So we're going to support it for a while. So I'm I'm one of those people that always has the contradictory um, perspective on this. Um, my my viewpoint is that I honestly. I do believe that one of the only reasons why Fiber Channel is still uh, really around and, and gets discussed and talked about is because of the investments that people have already made. Um, I think that if you were to, to start again, like I said before, if you go Greenfield and you put the two technologies up against each other, um, there is almost, in my opinion, no compelling reason anymore to choose Fiber Channel over iSCSI, especially with 40 gig coming out. Um, the, the arguments about performance, reliability, and stuff, those have pretty much diminished over the past couple of years. Um, iSCSI technology has come a really long way. And then, as you pointed out, um, people are even moving towards the direct attach model, right? So, so SAN in general is not quite the king that it used to be. Um, so it's kind of an interesting, it's kind of an interesting shift. Uh, so that that's my perspective. And and to be fair, I do work for a company that does both Fiber Channel and iSCSI. So I'm not just saying that because I think iSCSI is the is, because iSCSI is the only option. Um, we have both options, but personally, I, I think the future direction is definitely iSCSI. Just to add a little little to that. I, you know, Fiber Channel has been on its way out for a long time now, and it it's like tape. Uh, it, it eventually someday it'll go away, but there's still a lot out there, and we, we do still see a lot of interest in it. Yeah, I, I, I actually to... don't think that's going to go away. <laughs> 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 we, yeah, I, I have I, seen enough customer demand on that, so I don't, I don't believe it's going to go. I mean, I mean uh, definitely there are more and more demand on the iSCSI, but I, I just don't think F FC will always have a place. So. Yeah, and you also see more and more vendors Riding fiber channel drivers, so I think they're getting asked to do that by their customers. So we got five minutes the pure numbers. Yeah, that's that's the 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 one big question that everybody has is security, right? Um, there, there's you can find security questions and security issues no matter what, right? And and the problem is is yeah, you can you can. You can inject the argument about packet sniffing and, and breaking into the network and stuff, those sorts of things. It also holds true, though, the same thing. I get this all the time in OpenStack because of, hey, what are my guests having access to? What if somebody breaks out of the VM or breaks out of the hypervisor, et cetera? Those are questions and those are issues. Um, some environments, some shops, they will probably never be able to use iSCSI because of the perceived insecurities. Um, I say perceived. Um, but it, it just kind of depends. So that is one case. You're absolutely right. That is one case where I think it is going to make a difference for a long time. So are you asking about um, QoS for volume types? That was that's there's no blueprint yet. It's just uh, something that uh, we, uh, someone mentioned. It could be added in the future. Yeah. So Brocade has that support. So. Yeah. So so one of the things that we're actually thinking about adding it is support for QoS in the volume types itself too, as that uh, add that as a new back end. For the zone manager itself. Uh, there's a. Um, Back end QoS, which the arrays handle. There is a front end QoS that is a type, and Nova and the hypervisors support that. It makes sense, and the switches offer it to offer offer the middle uh, QoS uh, settings. So, the the structures there, the the switch companies are working on, or you know that it's in the future, but. It has been talked about offering that at that middle level as well. So unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, but we're all available if you guys want to grab us outside the door or even up here, uh, answer any other questions. But thanks a lot for coming. Appreciate it. Hopefully this was helpful. Thank you.